My name is Ronald Days, and uh, my birth date is January 29th, 1956. I am a native of St. Helena Island, South Carolina, in Beaufort County. My parents were uh, Henry Days Sr. and Kathleen Grant Days. My father died when I was nine. I'm the last of nine children. Gullah Geechee uh, identifies a culture, a language, and also a group of people, uh, those people who are descendants primarily of enslaved West Africans who were brought during the plantation era to work the cash crops of cotton, indigo, and rice. What traditions about the rice culture do I remember? <laughs> eating lots of rice. <laughs> right, eating lots of rice and um, also different uh, stories, beliefs, um, uh, I am a product of the Penn School. Both of my parents are graduates of Penn School, the class of 1933. So I grew up uh, attending the Penn, uh, the community sings at Penn Center. And because I was a member of the Brick Baptist Church, which is located just across the highway from the Penn Center, uh, singing spirituals uh, were an important part of my um, childhood, and that is an important aspect of Gullah Geechee culture and heritage. The rhythms of the songs are, are, and the types of songs, call and response, are all because of our West African um, heritage. And when I visited West Africa, or two West African countries in 2004 and 2005. Uh, first, Ghana, and following uh, to Sierra Leone, I, would begin, I began to hear these old spirituals from my childhood. And I uh, would tell, uh, document my experiences, seeing these firsthand cultural connections that I had heard about or read about but I was seeing them firsthand and I would write new songs to those old tunes. And those are the lyrics and the information that I share in my book, uh, Gullah Branch's West African Roots. And the songs and the readings from that book are in my new recording, Gullah Tings for Tink <laughs> Time management and having a good work ethic. Uh, uh, my mother would always uh, state, time and tide 
wait for no man. Uh, all my siblings recall her <laughs> giving that proverb okay. <laughs> to us. And it was uh, very important because we lived on an island and uh, we did not have an automobile. So there was usually people coming to pick us up. And she wanted to make sure that we were ready when they arrived. It was very important if you were traveling to Beaufort, the mainland, or beyond, because living on an island, there were drawbridges. And if you had an appointment on the other side of the bridge, you needed to make sure that you left in time so that if the bridge was closed, because the draw went up, that you would still make it on time or more before time, um, before your appointment. I also uh, vividly recall uh, my mother be when she would be preparing meals. Uh, my, the brother next, uh, just ahead of me, we were the last ones left home. And I would recall, you know, we would come home and we would be hungry and um, when are we going to eat? And she would say, in 25 minutes. And in 20 minutes, she would call us to set the table. Or if she said, it's going to be ready in 30 minutes, then in 25 minutes, she would call us and we would set the table. And that's the kind of time management that I that has been passed on to me. And I'm sure that's a part of her uh, being a Penn School graduate. Um, I always tell uh, people if they remark that uh, I do something well or if they are amazed at my skills and abilities to do anything and say, well, why do you think I'm, <laughs> I'm a product of Penn School graduates? <laughs> Penn School uh, was the, one of the first schools in the South that was established for freed slaves. It was started before the um, Civil War had, um, and it was called a light to the islands. Uh, it started uh, to um, be a training school as part of the P Port Royal experiment to see if freed slaves could be educated if given the opportunity. And it proved very successful in doing that. <laughs> There's several. Um, I remember during my childhood, uh, whenever uh, going to the Penn Center for any kinds of, if there were child, uh, uh, youth activities, or if uh, I was attending with some of my parents, there was a large oak tree and the limbs touched the ground and rose back up. And I would sit on those limbs and that was just a fun experience. In the 1970s, I believe, about the time that the Penn Center Heritage Days Festival started, the limbs were cut, so they're not there. Um, and that would be much like the angel oak tree uh, on John's Island. Um, when my wife is moved to South Carolina in 1983, and my, wife name, my wife's name is Natalie, Natalie Eldridge Days. She had come to take care of her grandmother, who had just relocated with her aunt, who had been married to a St. Helenian who had returned home. And her grandmother was sick. And um, she had come to care for her for about two weeks. That was the intent. But um, soon after she arrived, and we had met, I had taken her to Penn Center just to show her around and we had arrived on a Friday evening. 
and it was late in the late in the afternoon and I wanted to show her the Penn Center Museum and it was closed so I told her I can get a key so I went to the office and at that time I had been working on my first book Reminiscences of Sea Island Heritage which utilizes historic photographs from the Penn Center collection. So I went to the office and asked for the key because I wanted to go into the museum as I normally would do if I wanted to search for photographs. And we went in and she was so amazed that I could get access to go into this museum. And the words of the St. Helena hymn written by John Greenleaf Whittier upon the request of the Penn, Penn School's first African-American instructor, Charlotte Fortin, were handwritten on poster boards on the wall in the Penn Center Museum. And she, well, what does it sound? So I sang her, it's, it's, there are numerous verses, mm -hmm. but that really impressed her, she said, so that, that's an important memory. <laughs> As it should be. <laughs> Where did she come from? Syracuse, New York. Mm -hmm. She has now been um, in the South because she's joined me here at Pauley's Island for 31 years. We just, she and I just celebrated our 29th wedding anniversary. <laughs> I don't know if this person impacted me, but this is the memory that comes to mind of a cousin. Uh, she was my mother's first cousin, I believe, and they were about the same age. She was uh, slightly younger than my mother, but she went to every funeral. And she, if she, she didn't know, if she, she may not have known, okay. but everyone knew that if there was a funeral, she was going to be there. <laughs> yeah, she, and her children, um, when young, would always be accompanying her to the funerals. But that's just what she she did. And um, I'm trying to think of the T Tina McElroy answer mm -hmm. in one of her books. And she talks, she is about Gullah right. or Geechee culture. And there was a character who did just that. And I could relate to that. Because like, <gasps> she would do that. She would always be there. I remember when my father died. Um, and I had written about it uh, during my freshman year of college. When my father died, there was someone screaming in the back. It's like she was a professional crier or at a funeral. And all had been going well during the services. Um, my father died unexpectedly. And um, I remember sitting in the church and then this shriek broke out, but not having gone to many funerals before, that was something to be expected. That's what people did. And um, during visits to, I think it was to Ghana, and a funeral processional was going on. And in Ghana, uh, the bereaved family members dress in red. And there's this loud screaming. There must be screaming. That's part of making certain that the deceased, or attesting that the deceased is um, led a good life and will be missed. But I don't have any memory of this crier having um, had much to do with my family, right. but I was only nine at the time, right. but you know, that's what was done. I remember that moment as well. Um, I do cook. Um, my mother used to can foods, but I was never involved 
with that. Uh, there was a, another relative who lived in the same community as we did, uh, and her name was Miss Freeze. And I really, that was her basket name. I guess she was born on the first day of a hard freeze because her name was Hester Washington. And I really didn't know her real name until later in life. It may have been at her, um, for her obituary because she was Miss Freeze and then she was known as Miss Freeze. And although rice was not grown much, not as a cash crop, on St. Helena Island. Uh, I remember her in, in the field beyond her house, they, they, they grew rice and she would thresh rice um, and they had a mortar and pestle. Uh, my family did not. There were um, a neighbor because in the front of our house there was a low lying um, field uh, for a summer or two, he grew rice um, in the field in our front yard. But it wasn't the kind of rice production as done on large rice plantations um, because uh, the water level is so high. It's just the fresh water, the rain water would come down and uh, there were ditches um, that were dug and the rain or whatever would flow out. Um, but rice was grown in our front yard. And um, another, I, all, all of my grandparents had died before I was born. So um, there are a couple of women who I adopted as my grandmother. And one of them, uh, 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 an older friend of my mother's was Nellie Coleman. And Nellie Coleman, whenever she would come into someone's yard, uh, before reaching the door, she would call out, a go! And when I went to Ghana, West Africa, that's one of the things that the guide said, that's a common greeting. A go! And the response would be, Amin, a go! Amin, and I wondered, is that, was that a connection of hers from, had her parents um, or grandparents come from Ghana, perhaps? And because I remembered, this is a greeting that she, or it, I didn't even know it was a greeting. It was something she would do. She would be walking up to someone's house. I'll go, she would call out. <laughs> it was Dan, um, Dan Watson. And I write about Dan Watson in my first book. He's one of those whom I had interviewed. But Dan Watson would always, uh, he was a singer. He would sing at the community sings, or if uh, church groups traveled around to his, you could be certain that Dan Watson would be singing. He would say, my soul is a witness for my Lord. And he had his, it was a unique voice but he would sing, and that, that impacted. I, I recall how when I graduated from high school, um, the members of the Brick Church and, or members of the community, they all wanted to make sure that they gave me something. And the cards would have like a nickel or a quarter because they were, they were proud. And it was the same thing when, um, Oh, when my wife and I wed, uh, Natalie had decided that we were getting married in Beaufort. Um, so her family members came down and um, she was so surprised, shocked, she says, when she walked out of the church after our wedding and because we were married at Brick Baptist Church, and on the steps, the family was gathered to take a picture. And she said, there was just so much family there. She thought she would go back and get it up. <laughs> Absolved. Because <laughs> um, her family was not that large. And when we were preparing for 
uh, invitations and I told her her, home, her church that, she, that was too small. Um, but we planned for that and when she saw my invitation list, which remember I'm the last of nine and uh, my immediate family must include first, second, third and fourth cousins and she was not prepared for that. <laughs> <laughs> so she was shocked when everyone was lined up to take the picture. <laughs> I attended Buford High School, I'm a graduate of Buford High School. And then you went to college? I went to Hampton. It was at that time Hampton Institute, but Hampton University. Okay. And I should have known when I attended that Hampton and Hampton Institute and Penn School had a direct relationship. There were a number of Penn School graduates who went to Hampton Institute. There are a number of Hampton graduates who came back to Penn School and worked on St. Helena Island. And the year that I graduated from Hampton, was the 50 year anniversary of a brick church member. So there she was, <laughs> marching in <laughs> before my class marched up. <laughs> no one steered me. Hampton had a good mass media arts program. Uh, I had applied to Hampton and to Howard. I was accepted at Hampton. I think, um, I can't remember the other school that I had um, applied to, but I was quite pleased to have been accepted to go to Hampton. I had not visited the campus. It was an 18 hour Greyhound bus ride to Hampton. Um, when there was a transfer in Richmond, Virginia, and there were numerous other students traveling, not only to Hampton, but to other colleges. And I remember there was a call going to Hampton, uh, the exchange of buses, and I pulled all my stuff onto this other bus. And um, the bus driver came in and he had counted seats. Um, and he pointed, you, no, you, you were not here. So I had to lift all my things out and wait for the next bus. And then when we finally arrived at Hampton, there had been people on the bus. Oh, they remember me pulling all my, all my things off. But um, I don't know, that was another good experience from my childhood, that bus ride up. Because I would remember, again, songs. I would, in my head, I was singing songs from being part of the Brick Church Junior Choir, songs I had heard during the um, community sings. That was a very important part of my heritage and that kind of kept me calm. But I loved Hampton because it's surrounded by water. It reminded me very much of my home. <laughs> and being a historical black college and university, uh, it was very much like what I was used to being a product of Penn School where people spoke to each other and you had to address people in a certain way and you had to be kind and cordial as you met others. And there were those from New York City and elsewhere about the United States who found that so strange, but it was an expected of mine and I remember that the grad, the, my classmates would always say there was something different about me. Um, they said I spoke different uh, and I didn't think that I spoke differently. Um, I thought I had good elocution. Um, I <laughs> but they said there was something different about me. Maybe I wasn't born in this country but my parents were, or maybe my parents had been born elsewhere, but I was born here. Where was I from? I was from St. Helena Island, and uh, they would, I, I became close friends with other islanders from 
Jamaica and the West Indies, and we traveled together, and then we would be asked, you know, from time, and where are you from? And they would say, St. Croix or St. Thomas, and look at me, and I say, St. Helena. And then, and I say, okay. <laughs> <laughs> also at Penn, that was soon after Face of an Island had been published. And my mother, at age nine, is pictured in that book. There are aunts of mine that, that my whole community is in there. And I always take uh, my classmates up to the uh, history room in the library to show them the face of an island. <laughs> There is the folk belief of the hag. Uh, the hag is uh, believed to be an elder person. It could be a um, man, but almost always it's presumed to be a woman who has the ability to shed his or her skin, become invisible, and then throughout the night, it goes and torments people. It torments them by sitting on their ch chest riding them. Uh, supposedly they pull air out of their nostrils. It's also been said that the hag has the ability to pull the blood out and a hag sometimes would sell a victim's blood for profit. So if you know of a community member who didn't have a job or had just a piece of job it always seemed to have ready cash, it's probably a hag. And uh, there were ways to um, rid oneself of a hag. Babies were protected at night by putting matchsticks um, in the baby's hair because matchsticks had sulfur on it and hag supposedly could not stand sulfur. Some people would curse at a hag. Some people would um, place an open Bible or put, place an, uh, a newspaper somewhere in their room because a hag uh, would have to read the entire written content from back to front and had to read the whole document in its entirety before morning. If that did not happen, the hag would not be able to get back into its skin and then would die. Hags also were said to uh, throwing salt at a hag could rid oneself of the hag because a hag, if it had skin on it, salt on it, would not be able to get back in its human skin. And if it doesn't get back into its human skin before morning, it would die. I've learned uh, later that in some, I think, is it a Muslim traditions, like this written word, that's something to get rid of. So lots of times I thought, even in my during my childhood, my bedroom was covered with, not wallpaper, but newspaper. And I don't know if that was so much to rid the, um, the room of hags, or that's what was available. <laughs> but that's, that was what my room was decorated, just newspaper. Um, and that's something that I readily remember. Um, just recently, um, Brook, the Brook Green Gardens uh, partnered or served with the BN Duke Scholars uh, who came down um, Duke University and uh, did an interim project. And there was someone from Plantersville who she recalled um, encountering a hag. And uh, she said, if I remember her story correctly, that um, when she came home from the hospital with her newborn, and her husband was working at night, but when they were on their way home back to the house from the hospital, they'd stopped at a store, and there had been this old man who would not look at the baby. And then that night, when she was home alone, she said a hag began to ride her. Um, she had this, and she, this feeling. And when her 
grandmother had told her about this. She had no idea, like her grandmother was just making things up. But she recalled exactly what her grandmother had said and that was the feeling that she, and she got up and she went out side and she looked around and there was nothing and she was like, no, you're not gonna. And when she was telling someone the next day, they said, well, a hag was right. And even she recalled that hags generally can't look at newborns in the face and they come after that newborn. So that was what she registered was, it was that person who was doing it. And she went back to that store uh, either that next day or something, and um, asking, or I think she was saying, uh, I know who it was, and they best not come back, or something, and they didn't. <laughs> so she had confronted the person whom she thought it was, and she knew that that's who it was, because when she had come through, that individual had not looked at the baby. Oh, um, I had not, I guess when I look back over my body of work, I can say that it greatly influenced it. Um, from the stories that I would do as a newspaper reporter um, at the Beaufort Gazette, and following up with those stories after I left the Gazette and including those stories and others in my first book, Reminiscences of Sea Island Heritage. After it was published, my wife and I scripted the contents of that book into a performance piece that we called Sea Island Montage. We had just scripted a small portion of this performance piece and we were called by the director of the Penn Center to come to perform for a group of museum curators who were meeting at Penn Center on the next day. Would we? And we said, well, sure. And we, um, we took our written script, uh, it was typed, and in manila folders, we stood up, we read, we sang um, the songs, and the 50 museum curators gave us a standing ovation. And we said, oh, we must do something with this. And um, I began writing, uh, sending proposal letters or um, publicity they would call and then we for several years that's what we toured with this particular program um, it was not always well received um, we remember how um, people from our community who would not come to the program but they would want to question why are we doing this because it's just to make people laugh at us they would now when they came to the program they said, that was not the case we remember that uh, usually, as it is now, the uh, audience that really um, comes to cultural performances are largely non Gullagichi. And uh, when we started, there were numerous um, post performance comments. People would come up and they wanted shake our hands and come close and tell us that their fathers, parents and grandparents used to have the colored folks to come out to the, you know, and sing those spirituals or they would shake our hand or they would, Natalie remembers several times would shake her hand and say, well, you were just cute as a button. And um, we realized that those weren't the responses that we had hoped we're hoping to receive. So we began to tweak those performances and we no longer would get those kinds of responses. Um, here at Brook Green, and I um, 
narrated as well as scripted the Low Country Trail audio tour, which uh, the Low Country Trail has four sculptures unlike any other sculptures at Brooklyn Gardens. And they, they're cut with laser beams, they're made of stainless steel. And they are of four characters who help to shape what we know today as Gullah Geechee culture. They are the plantation owner, the overseer, the enslaved African male, and the enslaved African female. And I was tasked with coming up with an interpretive program that, helped, that would show the relationship within those characters. So uh, I scripted a fictionalized story about uh, the perspectives of each of those characters about life and death. And it takes place on a plantation day um, at Brook Green Plantation about some 200 years ago. Um, and there were those, oh, I, I got some comments, uh, people who, and they said that it did not show all the cruelty that was experienced by those doing on um, that time. And my, after, um, co you know, considering what was said, I said, well, that isn't what I wanted to leave people with. I want to leave with the strengths of our people during those times. And I think that's what it accomplishes. Um, my uh, books, my recordings, um, in a large part deal with just passing on uh, a sense of empowerment about Gullah Geechee culture. Legion, legion very, very important to the culture. Now there is a, a, um, an acceptance and a gravitating toward a sense of spirituality. And that is a very important um, connection with West African heritage. Or there's a belief that there's a spirit in everything. And um, one thing that I find about Gullah Geechee people is a sense of uh, discernment or awareness. Uh, my mother was born with a call. A call, those who, the filmy membrane that covers the head, those who are born with a call are thought to have special powers. My mother, as a child, um, would have sick people would be brought to her to be touched or just breathed on. It was thought that healing powers flow through their veins. Um, and when I asked my mother about you know, this phenomenon, and she didn't, but she did say she could always readily um, know what people were thinking, whether they weren't saying it or not. She had, a, she could grasp or discern what people were saying. And I, I, I was born in a hospital. My older brother and I were the only two born in the hospital. So I don't know if I was born with a call or not, but I do find that I have that same kind of spiritual connection. And I would find when I would sit on conference boards or just that people would say something or they would do something. And if afterwards I tell others, well, didn't you know that this is what they meant? And they would not. <laughs> and I think that there are other members of Gullah Geechee culture who have that ability. One Change has been uh, a, a disconnection from the culture, uh, uh, not wanting to be a part of or associated with the culture. That's uh, through my childhood. 
when uh, a vivid memory when my wife and I would do our CLM presentation for school groups. Uh, it was a Bluffton Elementary School where a third grader, uh, an African American, in the cafeteria, she turned around on that little swivel chair, cafeteria chair, she covered her ears, she closed her eyes throughout the whole thing. Those pictures of um, historical pictures showing aspects of slavery or even post-slavery or people dressed a certain way and we were singing spirituals and folk songs and talking about local history and it was just too much for her. She was ashamed and um, a change within the past 20 years or so, I would say there are a vast number of people who have begun connecting or reconnecting with our heritage and realizing that some of the beliefs in the stories, though humorous, uh, that there are connections with our heritage and that our heritage didn't begin during slavery that, um, and really a, a sense of pride. When uh, I served during my tenure as chairman of the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor Commission, uh, the Gullah Geechee Commission had a float in the second uh, presidential inaugural parade for President Obama. And um, the commissioners and guests, while we were waiting to get on, um, on the float, I asked participants and my two children, my daughter at the time was 24, and my son was either 20 or 19. Um, and I asked everyone what this meant to them. And uh, the commissioners and the older ones, for the most part, uh, one said something from, from the boat to the float from um, from despair to something like, we've come from this to this, this moment, this time period. And that's what some of the older people reflected on, what had not happened and what was happening or about to happen. My daughter, however, listened and she said, now, you know, she hears this sense of degradation and uh, that the others were addressing, but she and her contemporaries didn't have that feeling, and they were proud to be um, identified as Gullah Geechee. And that was a, wow, it was different for her. And that's a good change. Just yesterday, leaving Georgetown, going into Georgetown from Pauly's Island, and there was this long line of unending traffic. Um, I'm not a native of Georgetown, but even since I moved here, I did not witness all that. And that's the way it is um, when I returned to Beaufort County uh, on St. Helena Island. My, whenever I would drive my mother out and she would look at all these cars, she, she says as we were in the car, um, because there were no, and then few cars um, as she grew up and lived, um, that people generally walked. And as I said earlier, our family never owned a car. Um, so there are all these newcomers, these kamyas, um, building and building on waterfront property. So there's, there's fewer um, beach access or access to the waterways and the different crafts and just re recreational um, ability of people just to go and, and look at or enjoy the water. That's a threat to the culture. There's a growing sense of Gullah or Gullah Geechee being accepted as a language, 
but there are still numerous people who, even if they say it is a language, if you listen to them talk about it, they will refer to that dialect. I mean, and a dialect and a language are two different things. <laughs> um, so do they really believe, or are they just saying what they think is the right buzzword to use, and then as they converse a little more, you actually become more aware of what they are saying. The performers and the presenters of the culture, because there are numerous ones who give a misunderstanding that Gullah Geechee is monolithic, and that Gullah Geechee people only dress in African clothing, or Gullah Geechee people are only those who live an agrarian lifestyle, and that is not so. There are Gullah Geechee people who, are, who have PhDs, who have traveled abroad, who uh, may speak Gullah only when they get upset or angry, or may not speak Gullah at all, <laughs> but they, who are still Gullah, Gullah Geechee. <laughs>
in our home. <laughs> but I heard it at church, <laughs> um, in stores, saying I readily understood it. One of the things that the linguists with the project uh, did that was, I found very affirming, they, they said Gullah was a language. It had its own grammatical rules, and they would go through some of these rules, and they would say there's no need to use an apostrophe, which spoke to me because the written versions of Gullah would always have apostrophes, which usually means that a letter is missing. Therefore, it's bad English or broken English. But they said there's no need to use an apostrophe. D-A-T-S is the same as D-A-T apostrophe S, which means T-H-A-T apostrophe S. And that just, wow that made something rise inside. And um, so I assisted with that project. I think that all I have to say. <laughs> <laughs>